Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bios and Bookmarks Season 7 finale. This is Episode 6, and we are honored to be joined by Anthony Vani Capildeo. I'm Shivani Ramlochan, and as you know, the theme of this season has been A Change Is Gonna Come. Based on the name of the anthemic Sam Cooke song, envisioning how Caribbean people at home in the diaspora and everywhere can, with the tools that they have, make our world a better place, particularly in these fraught and uncertain times. Anthony Vani, it's an honor and a joy to be here with you to discuss Like a Tree Walking. Hello, Shivani. Thank you and thank Bocas very much for this invitation. I'm only sorry that I can't be with you in person. Trinidad, of course, is the place with the most remarkable trees, which formed my imagination as a child, and they frequently used to figure in my dreams, individual trees. I, for example, I was... there was one in, one in Tobago, for example, near to Stowe Bay, an almond tree, which when you looked at it, looked like a raster man holding his arms up in a crucifixion pose, because there were these dark and knotted places. And I imagined that tree could walk and that one day it came to visit. I had a whole dream which just consisted of looking outside and seeing the Tobagonian Rastafari am on the tree standing on the lawn waiting to say hello. I was going to confess to you right away, as soon as we began this episode, mm -hmm. that after reading your book and living with it for some time, I was reminded that I wanted to be a tree very early in my life. I think it was the first thing I consciously remember wanting to be other than myself at around three or four, because we had in, in Las Lomas, where I grew up, a huge plum tree in my yard. And I would look at the tree every day and think, I would like to be you, uh, not just live in you or climb in you, but I'd like to exist through your plumly eyes. And then <laughs> reading like a tree walking reminded me of that. So I hope you have all the visitations of trees that you desire while you are away from us in Trinidad. Thank you for speaking to you from Cyprus well which is the cottage in Cornwall that belonged to the late poet Charles Causley, who was a great writer of landscapes and folklore. He had grown up in the village and returned to live there after serving in the Navy. And uh, he said his greatest honor was teaching the children of the people he had been at school with in the same school. And there's something about this place which reminds me a lot of East Trinidad, uh, where my mother's family is from, and the way people speak directly to each other, but also with a kind of reserve, and the extraordinary, I don't even want to say outgrowth, but upgrowths of trees, reminds me of being on the edge of the Valencia forest. I love that. I can't imagine a better fate than to be surrounded by enormous trees. I often... I was going to say I often think, but I definitely know I'm more of a tree person than a person person. So having this conversation with you feels right and just and very green all over. Before I invite you to share your first reading, I will share your bio with our audience. So for those of you who don't know Anthony Vani and their work, and for those of you who do, they are a Trinidadian Scottish writer of poetry and nonfiction. Capileo's eight books and eight pamphlets include Like a Tree Walking, published by Carcanet in November of last year, and The Dusty Angel, published by Oyster Catcher, also last year. Their interests include plurilingualism, traditional masquerade, and multidisciplinary collaboration. They are writer-in-residence and professor at the University of York, a visiting scholar at Pembroke College, Cambridge, and an honorary student of Christ Church, Oxford. And I will add on to that, clearly a lover of trees. So with that introduction, I would be delighted if you would share your first reading with us, Anthony Vani. Thank you, Shivani. I'll be reading from Like a Tree Walking, 
which I personally just call the pink book because it looks like my favorite kind of cake, which is a parlor cake. If there is an afterwards, I'll find you where we met on stone by streets, I imagine. We may have lost people, not ourselves, not yet ourselves. If we have much to say, we do not say it. We have had years. A new friend is with us. New friends are hard to make in middle age. Who can introduce us? Silence runs like treetle over flint, coffee, river water, new words like petrichor, green willows, no words. If this were a sonnet, we could turn. Now I would turn and I should have rhymed. I am without those things they say a poem needs. Sugar falls off a donut in a bag, in a rose garden with a pack of cards. I wrote that poem in Trinidad during the 2020 lockdown, and for some reason I kept on imagining meeting a friend on the streets of Cambridge in the UK who had once read T.S. Eliot to me in a rose garden. The next poem comes from The Dusty Angel, but it's included in like tree walking. And The Dusty Angel consisted of seven walks, seven nocturnes and seven lullabies. Though, as it's been pointed out to me, the lullabies are more like nightmares and the nocturnes are more like lullabies. And those are all based around Queen's Park Savannah or up Lady Chancellor Hill or in the imagination of people trying to plan walks which don't happen. Lullaby number seven, for the grieved and glad. Why did I make you wait so long? Death is a passing state. Night comes late. The nature of a day is long. Strange angers come along. The street breathes us. We breathe the street. Why did I make you wait so long? Death is a passing state. Sweet whispering. The street wears us. We wear the street. Too living to be late. Too dying to belong. Why did I make you wait so long? The next poem was commissioned by the book at Litvest, but also partly inspired uh, both by the traditional masquerade characters of the Pierrot Grenade, who respells words, and the Midnight Robber, and by the preaching of Archbishop J. Revolution time. Revolution time is a turn, and a turn is a crisis, and maybe how you spell crisis is where Christ is, maybe not. Revolution time is a turn about a time not taken because taken for granted, forgiven. Were you taken through revolution time word search looking for love? Were you given evil when you wanted to live? Revolution is not a spell. Time is now. Time is devalued. Time is monetized, misgendered, is nothing if not now. Time is revolution you don't see. Revolution time happening inside. You can't tell by testing if someone is a revolution positive. One thirty second revolution. Who is turning inwardly? A man cutting grass turns into a voter. The child from Venezuela turns into a moco. The lady squatting down the road, you call her crazy. Then you turn a little inward and call her hungry. Take the time to turn and call her family. Call her family. I am wrong in every structure I take down, 
Everything we can sing to hope walls fall, we sing colonially. Also this, click off. Also that, click off. Revolution time is reflection and reflex action, refusing to react. Revolution time, when you love to kill your neighbor, but you click off. Revolution time is thinking again. Think again. Part of the story behind that poem was meeting one of the workers who cuts grass and he was cutting grass and hoping to finish in time to be able to vote in the last general election. Another part of the story is when Attila Springer was trying to teach me to stick fight during a walk around the savannah and we met a little child from Venezuela, very, very little about as high as our knees, who wanted to learn to stick fight as well. And I was thinking those children will be the future mass players. And suddenly I saw that child in my mind's eye, high, high, like a tree walking, our moko of the future. Okay, I've been reading for six minutes now. And this is quite a long book. I'm not going to read a long poem, though. I'm going to read the first bit of Windrush Reflections. This poem was commissioned by Poet in the City. Windrush lineage. They came in earlier ships, Mahade's ancestors and mine, with hope and by imperialist design. And I am too young to have seen them dying, as she says, on streets. I am resigned to dreaming them, wherever Victorian iron palisades the public squares like spears. I take her word that the bread they died wanting was British. The languages and laws denied them were British. For a quarter of the globe rose pink to cry empire, havoc, and natural resource. This was recent. Recent enough. My cousin saw them too. The finish of those ships overlapping as ships ineluctably do with others. Keening the curled wake with a forward-looking wave. The sea is like this. What you expect, nobody can expect. What you accept, nobody can't accept. What the great hungry puzzle stamped with a crown is must be big enough to see, big enough to ignore. Why wouldn't you take a canoe, a pirogue, carac, caravel, ocean liner, yacht, banana boat, naval destroyer, oil tanker or cruise ship? Why wouldn't you, when survival becomes an acquired taste, improvement a second skin, and home is a long-distance love affair with loss, and home is an arranged marriage to glorious, unseen London. Windrush wasn't the first. The voyage was not an arrow flying one way to lodge in sorrow. Island people met island people on the docks. Some were there a long time, some stayed, some went back. Twelve to a room cold and welcome. Post-war Britain already was home by birthright. Documentation was not a prize or a promise for this generation, born under the far-fetched Union Jack. Citizens drilled in the hymns and nursery rhymes, sweepings of a dust devil map. Singer, soldier, fabric designer, novelist, nurse, BBC presenter, stowaway activist, carnival maker, lawyer, bus driver, self-reinventor, brought up as British in sightline and grip crossing to Britain, the way some move to Leeds from York. Surely. Sure. No more. Sugar brickwork, tobacco boulevards, and bloody wool are the well-known parts, making Albion's very ground song 
a subclass of Caribbean harmonies. It takes a special effort to tune out the transatlantic jumbie jumble ripple in the Humber and the Thames. Here now, Lord Beginner, Lord Kitchener, Sam Selvan, V.S. Naipaul, Mikey Smith stoned to death in Jamaica, Una Marson ruling the airwaves, Wilson Harris, the Nationality Act in one of its ever revisable revisions, and the Prime Minister, and a journalist. So that poem was commissioned in response to the Windrush exhibition at the British Library. And my task for Poet in the City was to translate that exhibition to communities in Leeds, South Leeds in particular. So the, it's quite a long poem. The next bit is a cut up of all different Caribbean voices from the time, uh, together with Andrew Moore revising Theresa May in the Nationality Act itself. And then I go further into what the community groups responded to me. I would like just to finish this first reading for you with a little extract from In Praise of Trees. There's a stillness exercise that I've been practicing where you stand in the presence of a tree in the micro environment of sound created by a tree and you notice the furthest sound at the rim of your attention, the very furthest sound and just name it and know it's there. Come in a little closer. Notice the next sound, maybe a helicopter. Name it, know it's there, a little closer. And notice maybe a corn bird, a little closer. Notice the music the neighbor's playing, a little closer. Your air conditioner or your fan or the car in the garage or the dog outside. Keep moving in till you can even hear the sounds in your body. And there you center yourself in stillness. Now, what I did was I made this a dialogic exercise of listening with the tree and sharing the stillness of that place of silence and surround sound that the tree creates by bouncing sounds off its trunk, filtering them through its canopy and responding to the wind's voice. This is just one section from In Praise of Trees. First person arboreal. The fire tree picked out in its leaflessness by sodium lighting looks like things other people may not have seen. Frozen waterfalls in winter, jets of water frozen by strobe lighting. It is pale and I am tired. I lean against it and close my eyes. Before hearing the sounds far away from us, I must forget the sounds I made getting here, the bow I kicked, the creak of my coat, my feet in the mulch of dropped fire. I close my eyes and listen as if I were looking. Sound will not perform like sight. A road to the south roars like a curve. A road to the north roars stop start. I feel quite sick. Solitary runners clomp and make awkward diversions around us. Bigger than needed just for the tree. For my humanness, not my size, makes the tree bigger. We are obstacle. How much of what I expect from hearing is touch. The cold wind flips and ripples my hair across my forehead, and it feels like it should be a sound. I fool myself that I am hearing the hedge. It is tinnitus mingling with traffic in a small bay between my left ear and the tree trunk. I feel you while I hear me as only you allow. That's that I feel the tree as I hear my interior, only as the tree allows. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you for that, Anthony Vani. I confess I was in, in a little bit of a tree meditation with your last reading. 
looking at the tree closest to me and imagining myself being ever more proximal to it. I um during during our lockdown, our first lockdown in Trinidad last year, I happened to be quite ill and in isolation. And so the one thing that helped preserve my my sanity while I was away from my family was that I lived next to a public park in Tunapuna. And I would talk to the tree every day and and update update them on my condition and it and in that way we we marked out the passing of those slow and agonizing days together which is just one of the reasons why reading like a tree walking feels like it feels like many stages of of speaking about love in the world the love that we have and the love that we do not have and the love that is brutalized out of us and the things we reach for in difficult times. I um so thank you for that. Truly it um it's made such a tremendous difference in my life and in my living. I'm so glad to hear that uh, and uh, I do feel that uh, the tree silence poem could be used as a meditation exercise. I'm hoping it will be used and uh, used in different ways by different people. Sometimes for a workshop or in different kinds of reading, I actually lead people through a stillness exercise. Though obviously that could be triggering depending on what the sounds are around you. So I suggest you do it only in the company of safe trees, not savage and wild trees. <laughs> Yes, that sounds that sounds wise and healing. You said that in during the launch of your book online, hosted by by Carcanet Press, that for you, a poem must begin with acts of listening and with a necessary kind of silence. And it made me intensely curious to know what this silence has been like for you in these past two years of global isolation and and varying stages of disassociation frothness uh, tumult how how is that act of listening felt different or unexpected for you well there are two or three things going on at the same time uh, and I'd, I'd like to veer away from the pandemic uh, and uh, just hark back to the 1960s for a moment uh, because here in Cornwall, I was having a, a conversation a couple of nights ago with a couple who were young in the 1960s, uh, but did not live it in a 1960s-ish way. And I said, well, yes, my parents as well. My father had fallen ill. You know, My mother was in France and then in London. She was suspected of being an Algerian spy by the French who slashed her passport as she was taking a ship back to Britain. And they didn't have a lot of money. They were certainly not smoking weed or wearing Mary Quant, you know. So just as I think the 1960s in the lived experience of people is very different from the mediatized image we have. So I think the pandemic is very different for individuals and in many ways with an intensification of what was already there rather than a break. So for me, the pandemic style conditions began in 2019 when my mother Leela had a hip operation and uh, needed a lot of care and attention. But that meant we were entirely indoors, almost entirely indoors. And uh, when the pandemic began in its earnest phase of lockdown, and it happened to be lockdown in Trinidad, it was UE right in residence at that time, I started falling into a fury every time I did online events because uh, I would hear people say, of course, we are now all indoors. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, the doctors aren't indoors, the dock workers are not indoors, uh, and the people who are in jail have always been indoors. Uh, the people who are disabled have always been indoors. Uh, the people who are old and neglected have always been indoors. Uh, so why, why are you pretending uh, that no, we have all turned into enclosed nuns? Uh, and are walking around uh, in little cells contemplating light uh, and infinity, or when in fact also there are people in domestically violent marriages uh, and uh, 
sorry, I said marriage when, of course, partnerships of all kind. And uh, with with the, one of the poems I wrote, in fact, uh, I was reflecting on something that a friend of mine, Jack Belloli, had been talking about because he does a lot of community and pastoral work. Uh, and I was thinking about how when you don't let people go to the park, uh, often that's the only place someone in a domestic violence situation can pick up some Wi-Fi to call for help uh, or will speak to their sister or their pastor or whoever will be keeping them going. Uh, and closing those parks uh, isn't just a question of not being able to go for a walk. Those parks are really a lifeline in so many ways. Uh, or people who are studying and don't have good Wi-Fi at home, you can go and pick up Wi-Fi from somewhere or be quiet relatively. I just thought of the different, you know, it's it's not a question of we had leisure outdoors mm -hmm. and suddenly we were imprisoned having a different kind of leisure indoors, nor that we had freedom and suddenly we were prisoners. It is like, okay, everyone who is not already a prisoner refuses to learn from the prisoners. Everybody who is not disabled refuses to contemplate that they may become disabled. So instead of having humility to learn from the disabled and act in solidarity, they will rip off their mask and breathe on as many people as they can in defiance of the virus. So what I'm really hoping for is that people will sort of work around and not look at the pandemic at this time of great change uh, mm. or break with the norm, uh, but look for opportunities for greater interconnection and say, hey, how, how do, was it different for you? Was it different for you? Or how come it wasn't different for you? What were your strategies and experiences for isolation before the pandemic? Uh, what is your experience of being forced out to go to work during the pandemic? Uh, you know, how can we learn far more? about our common humanity and then not go back to a new normal, but a completely new world order, a much more humane one, one with time for trees. That's a massive rant, I'm sorry. Never be sorry for massive rants. Uh, I, the, the plague poems for, for Jack Belluli come quite early in the collection and, mm. and they begin with saying the inessential park is closed, which which to me felt like a, a very stern meditation on the things that we, and when I say we, I mean, not us, I mean the state or people who yeah. wield a certain kind of power will truncheon over others to say, this is how you can use these publicly allotted spaces. And this is how you can't ostensibly for some kind of greater uh, hygienic good but but really as you've just said the opposite is happening and it made me think that that image of the inessential park juxtaposed against what is most essential about nature so many people have spoken about a return to nature in the past few years because of the things we've been through but your collection seriously makes me question whether or not we deserve the nature we've inherited and, and what nature thinks about our own spectacular inhumanity. Well, the thing is that humans are part of nature. And uh, I remember reading the essays of Ernesto Cardenal a couple of years ago, which are much, much better in Spanish than in English. So I do very much recommend them in Spanish. And uh, at first, I was a little bit annoyed with some of them because the style was jumpy and you would make you think of the microcosms, uh, the algae and the moss, whatever. And then you see, and the cosmos and all of this is a wonder of creation. But then I realized that what he was trying to do, perhaps, is expand our capacity to know ourselves in common and interconnected with the uh, the huge spangling galaxy of patterned being or life forms. So every time people said nature is healing, uh, that sounds as if they think the houses that we build aren't the same as the nests the bird build. Uh, it's just the birds are better at being in tune with the environment than we are. So I, I think a return to indigenous and older ways of knowing and being uh, is something that's absolutely essential 
if this particular species is to survive. Because in many ways, the ways that we are bright are also the ways in which we're the most dim. You know, we know how to build things, and so we build shiny things that fall over. So <laughs> It, um, these poems just illuminated for me two things simultaneously. And on the one hand, how many things we as a human race get spectacularly wrong. And also how much we, we sometimes need to be united in our staggering wrongness just to feel more alive. But, but that being said, there are some kinds of wrongness and, and particularly the poems in the collection that navigate male hegemonic hubris and ego and the abuse attendant with that for which the, the speakers in those poems make no excuse in fact they're very incisive about pointing those things out i'm thinking about uh after an unspeaking where where the man whose presence just takes up the entire airport without permission and, and imposes itself on everyone creates this stifling choking aura and i was curious about knowing what what are the technical and if you want to talk about them emotional machinations you use to to address this to confront it and and refuse to let it go unspoken well one thing is that i'm not looking to be popular and I know I'm not. So I feel like I have nothing to lose. <laughs> and another odd thing is because Jack Belloli, who in many ways is one of the muses of this collection and the next, uh, practices a very Franciscan-influenced spirituality. And Francis of Assisi is the first uh, known named poet in Italian. Uh, so he went to war and he was also a troubadour of sorts. Uh, and he did a great praise poem uh, in which uh, he praises God for everything. Uh, but like Ernesto Cardinal, who's probably inspired by him, uh, there's a wonderfully mad sort of piling up uh, in which he also praises Sister Death, uh, from whom no man or no one can escape. So it's not just the pretty things. We always love the way he praises uh, Sister Death. Uh, and I think it's keeping that perspective of us as, as mortal beings, uh, which makes you realize that this, uh, not, not that uh, what do I have to do to be able to live with myself in the instant, uh, but what would I wish to have done if my life were flashing before my eyes right now? Which makes me think of the, the poems that address Odysseus towards the the end of, of like a tree walking where the, the very real danger of valorizing heroism and also of adulating the past are brought into a very sharp relief. And these things when, when held together for us in the poem seem like lessons, but nothing, nothing so insistently moral. It's more like the poems are pointing out studied ways, not, to be in the world and certainly we've seen we've seen the the damaging effects of, of reaching for heroism in in our anthropocene so if not heroes is the antidote to a hero a tree or a mountain or a lake or is that putting too much pressure on trees mountains and lakes I think it's up to us to be with uh, the trees, mountains and lakes uh, and think what it means to be interconnected with them and alongside them. And uh, with the Odyssey, I had actually been asked to, to produce some texts to be used by an actor, Christopher Kent, and a composer, Gamal Hamis, uh, who were doing a, a multimedia sort of dramat dramatized performance uh, which you can find at odysseyrecital.co.uk using also texts from canonical poets and a couple of other living ones, J.L. Williams and Yusuf Cosmier. And uh, so I produced these texts which are contained poems in themselves, uh, but I gave them full permission to fragment them or distort and remix them uh, in any way they liked. And I knew who I was working with. Uh, and uh, so in many ways I was writing for Christopher's voice and the body 
and Gamal's music. And uh, what I thought was particularly generous uh, was the way they wanted to include so many people in their project. Uh, they weren't putting themselves in front as the authors or the stars or the directors. It felt like a collective. Uh, and that made me rethink the Odyssey and how the Odyssey seems to be this one person wandering around heroically. But in fact, what struck me when I read it is that it's about how to be a host and how to be a guest. Mm -hmm. Every time Odysseus pitches up somewhere, he's in need of something. And people recognize him or not. His life is literally in their hands a lot of the time. How does he behave? How do they behave? And this, I think, speaks very much to our situation at the moment. And also to coercive ways that we can be nice. Like, do we always host? Do we accept being hosted by others? When do we decide that strangers are guests? Would we accept strangers as hosts? And that the the hero that we imagine in in one incarnation is not always so heroic. Like the, those poems, really, sort of they're they're teeming beneath the surface with what what is a hero? Who is nothing more than a mortal being? Do when they're in their downtime, how are they to their wives and, and to their spouses? And how incredibly insane it is to pin perpetual acts of valor on anyone or anything. Except I, you, um, Giovanni, except you. That <laughs> I'm going I'm gonna take that as a, a remarkable mama guy, but accept it with love. No, <laughs> I've been teaching your poems and, and you are consistently heroic to your, my students. Oh, goodness. I, well, I'm absorbing that into my little plum-like heart of, of my four-year-old self, who's very delighted uh, to be read by your students. And there's there are lots of trees in this book, but there also is a great deal of walking. And, and walking has become also has become a way many people around the world have tried to navigate the past few years and of course the past several thousand years of recorded history but in in the walking poems in your collection walking is never an innocuous uh act unshorn of violence, particularly those walks that take place in Trinidad. I mean, there's the image in walk number two of the Raper Man corner. That's a specific man. Do, do you know? Oh, Sorry, no. anyway, never mind. No, no, I want I want to hear about that. But but probably, that probably not on camera. <laughs> the, the Raper Man corner adjacent to the gingerbread house, which just feels like everyday life for for all people in Trinidad, but particularly women and non-binary people trying to navigate these streets. But tell me, tell me about what you were just going to say, because I, I do no. want to know. <laughs> no, no, no. There was a specific man whom I nicknamed Raper Man, because oh. he used to sit there calling out to detailed anatomical things to people at considerable length. And he also disturbingly had a pram with him. Oh. And I don't know what was in the pram or why he had a pram. Oh my goodness. But I I just thought just thought of him as a rape of man in my mind. I would tell myself, oh yeah, you know, you keep running till you get to rape of man corner. Then mm -hmm. you can, it became one of the ways I measured distance. So like how you can say until I reach the tulip tree or the side with the hospital or whatever. Yeah, and these these violent designations are also quite factual like they're yes. part of how people allocate space in Trinidad and and everywhere and so I wanted to know more about the the violence that is both overtly discussed in the poems and the violence that I sense sort of just teems beneath the surface of all of them and is walking is walking in Trinidad to you a singular sensation as distinct to when you walk anywhere else in the world well 
one thing is that I know more people that know them better in Trinidad uh, than at any other single place in the world, uh, despite having spent a lot of the last uh, 30 years in the UK. And uh, so it, it's a little bit like when people say that lawyers are the most corrupt or academics are the most corrupt. Or The fact is just that I know people's stories more. And so I, I have got a deeper sense of the micro history of what happened and didn't happen in individual streets. I think possibly one of the feelings of violence uh, that haunts Trinidad, which I don't feel as much in the UK, is just the presence of high-grade weapons. Mm -hmm. So while I have been threatened and followed in the UK, I have frequently shouted at people or shaken my fist in return and they run off. And in Trinidad, I would not do that because I don't know if they would shoot me or put a mark on me and come after my family. I mean, up, up till quite recently, I was walking with an Iranian poet friend uh, in the streets in Cambridge, uh, and we were with a white friend, a man. And when he left the two female presenting brownish people alone, uh, within minutes, a group of young people came up and started shouting in our faces and blocking our way. And I shook my fist at them and growled. <laughs> and they ran away because they were little people. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't do that here. <laughs> Sorry. So th that really is, is one of the main things, just, just better weapons control. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think is uh, the ability to be theatrical. So there's a way in which people kill, maim, or attack imaginatively in Trinidad. And I don't know if this is a transgenerational legacy of there being many, I'm not going to say of enslaved people, but of many different warrior traditions, uh, because there are many different warrior traditions uh, and also many different systems uh, of smaller and bigger local or indigenous government uh, coming in from different parts of Africa, different parts of India, different parts of China. So we have uh, not just a legacy of costume or of dance or of food or of language. Uh, we also have legacies of punishment, torture, and uh, we haven't confronted and unpicked what is good and what is bad, uh, what is fruitful and what is violent uh, in those transgenerational legacies apart from slavery. So I really do think there's a way in which uh, I could expect here in the UK to get mugged by somebody and hand them my wallet, uh, mm. but I don't know what would be the finish, what would be the style of a robbery in Trinidad, that there would be some sort of framing, some gesture in mind, uh, that it's not done until something. We tie the person up or we whatever. Yeah. Does that make sense? A kind of style? It makes see, all kinds of sense. And yeah, I see particularly... style in so many things, style in walking, style in gardening, style in how you lay a table, but also style in frame. It, yes, my mind is, is slightly imploding at how true this is and, and how certainly the, you could open a Trinidad and Tobago newspaper to any day in the past 10 or 15 years. And that stylistic, the aesthetics of how crime is committed here would mm. just prove everything you've said to be true. I um, I think the, the last question I want to ask before I invite you to do your second reading is about the, the centers that you so generously shared with us. And I think of a center always as an invitation to let many voices in, inhabit one. And, and the voices in, in the first center are so sometimes opposite and disharmonious. We have a, a space in the poem where Theresa May is allowed to her words anyway, allowed to align alongside Sam Selvon. What what are the effects of that invitation of multiple voices, many of whom with whom you may not agree, to, to reside in you and then birth the centu? And it can be, you know, your response can be specific to these two centers or or any way you've used the form in the past. 
So we're talking about the Windrush Commission, where I did an introductory section, which I just read out for you. And then there's a centro with the voice, Cento, centro with all the voices of Windrush authors, but also, as you say, Theresa May. And then there's a further section, which is another kind of introductory section about the Windrush exhibition in the British Library. And then there's a second and last centro, which is the voices from the Leeds community I was working with. For me, the effect is uh, threefold. One is there are all these voices knocking around in our heads, but, there, but do we allow them space? So we might not think of Una Marston, except if we're in the space of thinking about Una Marston. We might not think about Theresa May, unless we're in the space of the airport queue or watching the BBC. So I wanted to put them all in one space, uh, which is not hierarchized. The second thing uh, is the idea of silence and interiority, because for me to acknowledge uh, that all these voices can be noticed, uh, like the sounds in our microenvironment we share with the trees, uh, to acknowledge all these voices are knocking around in us uh, is a beginning uh, of being able to get to a stable core and finding our own interior silence and composing a, a more harmonious music of our multiple voiced lives. So not exactly like an exorcism, not like trapping a witch in a bottle, but more like when you take all the crayons out of the box, or all the crayons out of the bucket and put them on the floor and you say, see, this is all the colors you have to, to make a picture with. Now start to arrange and choose. And then, then the third thing really is uh, I'm not very keen on my own voice or so the idea of I as a narrator. So the last thing I wanted to do was say, oh, I am the special <laughs> person who will tell you the story of Windrush. And the only thing I could really do ethically is this kind of patchwork, this kind of it's pitchy patchy. It's like a Perot costume. So it does inform, send to inform, does what a Piero costume, not Piero words, what the actual costume does. It's made of many patches and colors, but includes a heart. Thank you for that. Wow. Yeah, it actually makes me think of if, if one were in need of books to help survive this time, it, it, would, it would work quite well to to live with like a tree walking but also your collection your full-length collection previous to this one skin can hold which is so richly and strangely carnivalesque those two books so so right now they're actually sitting next to my bed uh and i've just gestured so everyone knows where my bed is now um together because they they provide something twin that is both everything we've been lacking during lockdown and also everything we we can hope for in the future mocha jumbies trees scarlet ibis spectacle all of it is Metanoia. there yeah <laughs> i i'd love to invite you to read to give us your second reading from like a tree walking anthony vani I do feel that I ought to read uh, that Cento Cento. So this is part two of the Windrush poem, which is made up from the snippets of Windrush authors, uh, plus Theresa May and Ruma and the Nationality Act. Windrush Caribbean Cento. Things does have a way of fixing themselves. Can make blood out of stone. Be it enacted by the King's most excellent majesty one grim winter evening when it had a kind of uneasiness about London, bind with the advice of the Lord's spiritual and temporal and commons, fury and diamond. Is a place where everyone is your enemy and your friend, or else like charcoal to grain, an act to make provision for British nationality. I am glad to know my mother country. Rest then, my heart, thou knowest but too well, I and I alone, where I come from, you take what you want and you pay every Friday and for citizenship of the United Kingdom and colonies. But let me just look at what the policy, cricket, lovely cricket, but I keep coming back to it. 
your hostile environment policy, the compliant environment policy. The government is taking action against every person who under this act is a citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies, a dancing dwarf on the tarmac, spirit of leaves like smoke, a burning injustice, but our hearts are white, a burning injustice, but their hearts are black. God is sending you his spirit, wind rush. This lady died because the English people are very much sociable. Every person born within the United Kingdom and colonies in the womb of converted horse, in the Christmas supplement of the color magazine, you're absolutely right. Shall be a citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies by birth. But as we go on in, cockroach, rat and scorpion also come in. What is it that a city have that any place in the world have? Room demerent, hate that iron tear. He looked in the mirror one day and couldn't see himself. Citizenship by birth, citizenship by descent, citizenship by registration after all was said and done. Birth is never treason. And he began to scream. You thinking about the thing without a name. You get so much like it, you wouldn't leave it for anywhere else. Subject to the provisions of this section. Second test, and the West Indies won. So I'm going to do just one more thing for my second reading segment, which this is. And this is a sneak preview of Gentle Housework of the Sacrifice, which is a pamphlet which is coming out with Guillemot Press. As many of you will know, Guillemot is a kind of bird, a coastal bird. And it completed this during the lockdown in Scotland. Tales of loss and longing. I walked to the lighthouse with you, all of you who were absent, and I said, the face of the moon soon would be ploughed up. And you said, conscious of the queen of heaven, the moon doesn't have a face. And I said to you, presently, the moon would be furrowed in a way you could see from earth. And then we looked half absently at the ruby cloud in gathering and the tactless moon encroached upon us, endeared itself to us, displaced in time from us, exploitable in names like ours. And I said, exactly because you aren't here, walking past the old chained pier, which is shut, and are you hurrying into a sleepy pleat? I said, when I can't see, I hear the lift in your voice. When I can't hear, I feel the lift in your form. When I can't feel, I sense the lift in your heart. I say it walking with you, when you, absent, perhaps not walking, reply. The face, the lighthouse, some harmony, the moon. I'm going to read one more from Gentle Housework of the Sacrifice and then return to the great joy of speaking with the Inn of Double Shivani. This is called Accusation, Affirmation. Believing that dogs will go to heaven, there will be dogs in heaven. Wanting all the dogs in heaven, there will be dogs in heaven. Not leaving enough dogs for other people in heaven, there will be dogs in heaven. Thank you. I feel extremely hopeful about the the reality of, of that final poem and it, it is just filling me with joy right now as I think of all the dogs I've loved and lost and will hopefully love again and I hope that the sentiment of that poem also extends to cats 
<laughs> oh, it extends to all animals, but I was harassing people's dogs during lockdown. In Scotland, we were allowed as much exercise as we wanted, uh, as long as it was within the bounds of the city of Edinburgh and alone. And so I started saying, hi, dog, to people's dog across the road. And because it was Scotland, nobody beat me up. <laughs> you know, I'm sure the dogs also greatly appreciated this. Some of them did. One of them, who was a St. Bernard, got confused and tried yeah. to herd me. <laughs> it thought it was in some way lost. It, it, it has been a complete pleasure. I enjoy talking with you. But I can't let you escape into the trees before we play Promptly Written, which our viewers know is our interactive fun segment of bios and bookmarks powered so by the us. NGC Focus Lit Fest. It, and I have to tell you, everyone I've had real fun coming up with Anthony Vani's prompt for today. But first, the scenario. Anthony Vani steps onto an elevator. Inside the elevator are the publisher and editor of their dreams. Now they're already in conversation in this elevator when they get in there. And what they're talking about, the publisher and editor, is this dream project that Anthony Vanni is going to pitch them their their passion idea to. Now this idea can be can be a book, it doesn't have to be a book, it can be a play, a sculpture, a an art ed- exhibition, a wearable suit of birds. I mean, any, anywhere the mind can go is because these people have unlimited resources to make it happen. So as you all know, we pair our prompts specifically for each writer on bios and bookmarks. And Anthony Vanni's prompt is, bury your navel under a silk cotton tree. Anthony Vanni, over to you. Bury your navel string under a silk cotton tree. And I would like a spiritual interfaith inventory of every single tree and its progeny throughout the region and all trees to have protected status while this inventory is underway. Inventory. And uh, when it is uh, completed, I would like us to remember that the holy places of all our religions and none, so the holy places of our ecology are not just the buildings in which our breath is contained, but the ways between places and also the outdoors. It is very serious to have access to rivers, to the sea, to caves, to trees. That is a serious matter. And so I would like fully disabled, accessible, gender inclusive and class inclusive spiritual educational trails, all with First Nations input and leadership between all the trees deemed most significant and with transport by land or water as appropriate, transport by air completely forbidden to anybody not of Sukuyan status. And that is my project. I am And I think now... it starts up. I think it starts up actually in in learning about mangrove. Because mm-hmm. when I was at school I learned uh, forgive me if this is not correct because I was only good at physics and I was forced to do biology. So I, I learned that uh, the sea fish come in to breed in the mangrove uh, and then go back out. So if you clear away the brackish mangrove clumps and waters in the interests of so-called national beautification and development, then you do not have plenty of fish in the sea, far from it. And I think it's that fascination with the weird, ugly, otherworldly, beautifully ugly world of the mangrove and how that that is a, a place of intertwining between the well-being of our seas and the fertility of our lands, that I think that was my first sense of the sacred, even though the late Pandit Sam told me about spirits and trees, even though like a tree walking is a quote from the Gospel of Mark, even though 
there was a First Nations guide on a hike I did up Tamina who showed us how to honor a sacred tree. In spite of all of that, uh, it's really that early science lesson about the importance of our borderlands uh, and the mixity, the literal mixity of salt and fresh water, of root and soil and water, of tree and fish. That for me is, is what we need to look at. We, we belong with them. I hope so, that someone, someone extremely deep pocketed is watching this episode and can finance this endeavor fully because I need to walk on those trails. I need to embrace those fish populating in the mangroves. Uh, this is, this has been a truly mesmeric hour with you. I can't believe it's already over. I, I, I also can't imagine a better way to end the season of, of bios and bookmarks than with you, Anthony Vanni. Thank you for this remarkable book, which is one installation and in what is a prodigious and fascinating and bad mind and wonderful series of books and pamphlets and, and creative rebellions that you share with us. I am so glad and grateful to be in a world where you are producing and resisting and defying. Thank you. And as it is Good Friday, I hope that you have hot cross buns now. I'm going to find some. Of course, we're recording on Good Friday, but you will all be seeing this on Thursday 21st, which means that when you do look at this in the future, hello to the future, the NGC Boca Slit Fest will be just one short week away. The entire program guide is available for download on our website. Please attend as many events as you can. They're all free and accessible to you. We hope to see many of you there in lieu of not being able to see you in person, which we hope will happen next year. Thank you again so much, Anthony Vani. Thank you to all of you who've been tuning in this entire season. Bios and Bookmarks, powered by the NGC Boca Slit Fest, will return for season eight very soon. Thank you for keeping art safe, wild, and participatory. Thank you.